Hello, you're watching Daily Debrief, your daily news analysis show brought to you by People's Dispatch. Now, normally we do three segments of news from around the world, but today is a special episode. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most momentous incidents, momentous events of this century on its 20th anniversary. It's been 20 years since George Bush, Tony Blair and their allies, after a prolonged campaign of lies, led a coalition of willing countries into Iraq in a brutal invasion. 20 years later, the impact still continues, millions dead, millions displaced, the international order suffered a huge blow, there's a new Cold War which also maybe emanates from that period. We'll be talking about all this with Prabir Purkaisa. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. Now, this is an issue we can probably talk for hours on this, but within the limited confines of this show, you know, how would you sort of, let's first take the region because that re the whole of West Asia has never been the same since uh, that period. You know, so much has happened. So how would you first maybe take a look at how that region has really sort of changed? What has been the impact of the war on the region itself? Well, the first is, of course, the fact that triumphalism hmm. with which the U.S. forces entered Iraq, they could make the whole region any way they wanted. Hmm. And they had the position to, they felt after the world had become unipolar in the 90s, the uh, Soviet Union had dis disintegrated, Russia was weak, the various oligarchs were in power, the Putin had taken over in 1998, I think. It still was a phase in which Russia was seen not to be a, a player. Right. So therefore, the US felt that they had a unique opportunity to remake the world as it pleases. And 2001, the attack on the World, world Trade, Trade Towers Center. meant that the United States, in the United States, the people would rally behind a war. So if you remember, they did the 14-day military operations in uh, Afghanistan, huh. taking over Kabul, and it was 14 or 18 days, they took over Kabul and declared victory. But there, uh, I was really not on Afghanistan, and it was really to the World Trade Towers which led to the attack on Afghanistan. But the really there, I had always been on Iraq hmm. and deciding that Saddam Hussein and Iraq would be a very good target to start remaking West Asia. Right. In fact, there is a famous map, which are the countries which will be attacked. If you remember, General Wesley Clark talks about this map that he saw. And that map is quite interesting because the countries named were indeed attacked. Right. So in this, Iraq was the key uh, one because they felt that Saddam Hussein could be deposed of very quickly. Militarily, they'd win very easily. And after that, they could make Iraq any way they wanted. It will pay for itself because Iraq had enough oil. And therefore, it will be a win-win hmm. that uh, Iraqi people would welcome them. That was their vision of what Iraqi people would do. And it will be an easy war. I don't think they ever thought of what the consequences of the war would be or if their calculations go wrong, then what would happen? The first thing is, let's look at the American people and the media. The media knew that this whole claim on which the war was being framed was wrong. The yellow cakes, Niger yellow cakes, that they were buying uh, uranium, uranium uh, possibility of converting it to weapons grade uranium, the buying, the, buying this yellow cakes from Niger. That story was known to be false within the CIA, within the US military establishment, within the foreign policy establishment. Yet it was being pushed by Cheney and it was being pushed by Colin Bolton, Bolt, Bolt, uh, Bolton, who was the, uh, the hawk within the uh, establishment at that point. And also, let's not forget the, to, uh, do not forget the role of Tony Blair, the UK foreign Mon minister, who also got his intelligence agents to prepare a report yeah. just for as a, a particular uh, group within the US intelligence agency also prepared a report saying all this is, we are going there, the weapons of mass destruction are continuing, uh, weapons, nuclear weapons, as well as chemical weapons. All this was the lie that was sold. The point again is the American people bought it. And even world over, there was a belief that Saddam is really very bad. Therefore, getting rid of his not so... Not so. 
not such a bad thing for the rest of the world. Nobody wanted to, or let's put it this way, people really didn't want to support somebody like Saddam Hussein who had used chemical weapons in Iran. Uh, his litany of sins are quite large. So given that, it was, it was surprising. I was surprised by two things. How well the lie was sold to particularly the American people who even today a large number believe that not only did Saddam have weapons of mass destruction, they believe that actually U.S. forces and the United Nations found weapons of mass destruction after the war, both of which we know to be wrong. So that is one thing. Secondly, the belief that you could sell lies forever is not too wrong if that is so, because this is their domestic audience. They could sell that lie and maintain it even till today at least to large sections of its people. But what was the unintended consequences? Winning the war was, uh, the winning the, uh, the war was easy, but it didn't lead to victory right. because the resistance that sprung up, getting uh, rid of Saddam was the easy part. Oh. Running the country oh. was something that, what the old colonial powers were successful in doing, the neo-colonial power of the United States, which militarily much stronger than obviously Iraq and other governments, but it was unable to run the country. And the fact that they didn't really know anything about Iraq, its history, the fact that there is no foreign office in the United States capable enough of understanding the region, except what they thought the region was, all of this, of course, led to the unintended consequences, the rise of Iran as a much bigger influence in the region. Remember the, line, the war that was fought on Kuwait it was preceded by the war that Iraq fought against Iran. Right. And in <laughs> fact, Iraq was backed by the United States and all the weapons of mass destruction, the chemical weapons that the West talks about, were chemical weapons supplied by UK and the United States to Iraq. And that we all know. In fact, the argument, the joke that was there was, of course, there are no uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, that Iraq has because they supplied it. Okay, so those were the, the issues that 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 I think took the American people by surprise, and also the American policymakers by surprise because honestly, it has been a disaster of two kinds. One is the Iraq became ungovernable. Hmm. The Iraqi uh, resistance there, which was nationalist plus the, plus the Islamist, plus the old uh, Ba'ath forces, which still had some allegiance to Saddam Hussein, dismantling the civil uh, structure as well as the military, the army was disbanded. All of it meant there were guns, there were people who could use guns, and you just handed it over, resistance over to them. So all that meant Iraq could not be governed. And the Americans, though they lost very few number in overthrowing Saddam, the long aftermath of that, right. they lost many more troops. Right. And in fact, uh, whatever you may see, the American uh, television, media, even Netflix, all of that today, shows you how much of uh, heat that American forces took in Iraq, because that's the only thing you see in their media even today, okay, that how Americans liberated Iraq at great cost to themselves, and it really talks about the resistance afterwards. So I think for the West Asian politics, it was a, the, a huge uh, self-defeating goal that the United States did, because it weakened the supporting structures they had built over a period, period and it meant that Failing to remake it, remake it means that it led to all kinds of other forces coming up, which, of course, has been a huge uh, blow to the region itself, hmm. to the people. Exactly. Iraq is still, you know, splintered. There still is really the fissures in society which they opened, Shia versus Sunni, which actually under Saddam had almost did not exist. Identities were there, but they really didn't fight each other like the way they did, separating into different parts of, uh, of the country. Shia areas, Sunni areas, all that, the sectarian conflict was really created by the United States over there. And then, of course, the Shia forces, which were, very, were close to Iran, they become much more powerful. Right. So I think all of that... And of course, ISIS also emerges 
Also because the United States worsened the issue with the interventions in Syria and Libya, which, you know, just they kept repeating those mistakes only in greater dimension. Yes, that, I think, that's the other interesting part. What brings up the ISIS in that region? And you're quite right. It starts really in Iraq. Hmm. And in fact, as you know, again, American sources have talked about how they initially let the ISIS forces grow in order to build pressure on the Iraqi government to keep American troops hmm. and also tow American line. You see, when Americans tried to quote unquote remake Iraq, the issues that they instituted were very clear. One is what kind of laws? Essentially, neoliberal laws were put in place. Oil will belong to whom? They thought the American oil companies, except they couldn't govern Iraq. That was the problem they still have. But what it opened itself to was resistance of all kinds. And they thought that since the ISIS is a force which is growing, that is the one which they had a tacit, shall we say, understanding about letting them grow. Is there something more to it? Did they use uh, directly their resources to, resources to bolster it? I'm not getting into that because these are, this would be much more conjectures. But there's no question, enough evidence that they allowed it to grow, thinking it will put a pressure on the Iraqi government and that will help them to then uh, come back, to a, at least be there much longer. Right. And therefore, its resources will continue to be available. Uh, so that was one part of it. Secondly, they also saw this as a very important instrument against a secular government to the Ba'ath government in Syria. Hmm. And therefore, these forces were used in order to attack Syria as well. And then the Saudis, who today may back off from that, the Saudis, the Qataris, the and Turkey, Kuwaitis, and Turkey, as you said quite rightly, they all played a role. So all of these forces were, uh, Turkey actually we have to demarcate a bit from this because Turkey of course wanted territorial, <laughs> you know, access to that region and thought they will get a chunk of it. Right. But uh, the, the while they did support, but they supported all kinds of forces mm. against the central government in Syria. Mm. But the, the ISIS forces mm. were nurtured really from Iraq mm. and they moved from Iraq into Syria. So this was much more under, age, under the ages of the United States. And even today, there is a good 30% of uh, Syria under a de facto American control, which they're saying tribal uh, forces and so on, which essentially mean they are the remnants of the ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda, etc. forces, which aligned with the United States. That, that's also the area which has oil. It's also a fertile area. But the American uh, intervention, therefore, continued in this form in the region. The net result is it has weakened the United States in that region over a period of time. 20 years down the line, you can see, U.S. does not have the kind of credibility it had, and it does not have the political ability to intervene in the region right. that it had. Right. So slowly, you see the erosion of the United States. And I would say the critical start point of that is actually the Iraq war. Absolutely. And like you said, today we have a situation where even such a long-term traditional ally like Saudi Arabia is at loggerheads a bit with, of course, there are more reasons like the Ukraine war much so much, but a lot of it also stems from that moment where I think the US really lost it, what it claimed to be this force which could create democracy. That was its big narrative. It could create democracy. It could create the rule of law. And that example it sort of cited across the world completely crumbled in Iraq from 2003 onwards. Well, you know, they have always sided with also the most exactly. anti-democratic <laughs> leadership of countries. Saudi Arabia, of course, being a prime example of that. But I think you must also see in this the strategic issue that the United States, they thought about as oil. Yes. Now, oil is not a strategic resource necessarily for only the United States. Yes. They saw if they control the world's oil and the exportable surplus was seen to be, uh, of course, a big part of it was in West Asia. Yes. If we take this into account, the Carter Doctrine essentially says that 
the oil resources of this region mm -hmm. is of strategic interest to the United States. Mm -hmm. So effectively what I keep on saying that uh, our oil is under their sand is basically the Carter Doctrine. This means that the energy resources of the world, particularly in terms of oil and gas, is going to be controlled by the United States. Mm -hmm. This was the basic understanding they had. Now look at it this way, you break up Iraq and you are not able to control it. You attack Syria, you are not in control of it. You have already tried to isolate Iran, hoping there will be a color revolution there, it didn't happen. Saudi Arabia, well, you wanted to back one crown prince against another and that, that palace game you lost. You never seem to have regained uh, grip on that again, so that's Saudi Arabia. All of it is coupled with the fact that increasingly the United States is no longer a major trade partner oh. of most of the countries in the world. 80% of the countries today, 70 to 80% shall we say, uh, the primary trade partner is China, right. not the United States, which was not so in 1990, for example, or 2000. So this is a huge strategic shift that has taken place. So essentially the world's resources which were under the control of the United States, essentially hydrocarbon resources, oil and natural gas, that is something which today is slowly slipping away. Yeah. Of course, Russia is one of the major exporters as well, but uh, Venezuela is another exporter. They are both under sanctions. Iran is under sanctions. So three major oil producers are under sanctions, economic, financial sanctions. Given all of that, what happens is that this region does not therefore want to become uh, come under the umbrella of the United States. Turkey is asserting its independence, relative independence, even being a member of NATO. Saudi Arabia would like to distance itself and be able to play a more important role, is willing to now price its oil in also Chinese currency right. yuan. So all of this means that there is a sea change taking place. 2003, you know, the interesting part of it for me, I had gone to United States few months before the war, is how the media accepted the narrative in totality. Mm. Today, even today, the United States media accepts whatever U.S. says in totality, the Ukraine war, for example. But the point is the credibility of that mm. messaging of the United States or U.K. or of uh, Western European countries, the G7, uh, etc. You can see that credibility is no longer there. Right. Large parts of the world doesn't believe in that. And I think the break in that really comes with the Iraq war. Right. It was so blatantly done. Only the American people, at least I'm, I think the uh, polls show that 42 percent of the American people were believe the WMDs were found in Iraq. Right. Okay, forget whether they were there or not, but they were found by the American troops over there. I think that kind of uh, grip that American media had on the world in terms of what people believed or didn't believe, even though their grip on media has only strengthened. Hmm. Okay, news Technology and sophistication is strengthened. Strengthened. In spite of that, the belief is, the belief is no longer there. Hmm. And I think that's a huge change that has taken place. And I think Iraq war and its aftermath, though didn't obviously lead to emancipation of the Iraqi people from American grip. Even now, America is very much in Iraq. What it did, it has weakened its hmm. ability to convince the people of its stories right. anymore. Right. So I think that is the, what the Iraqi people have paid as a price, the region pays as a price, but I think rest of the world at least now has a clearer picture. Mm -hmm. When Americans say any of these things, People think, well, it could be right, but it could also be wrong. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir. And like you said, while a large percentage of people were convinced, there were hundreds of thousands who also in the U.S. in many other parts of Western Europe protested. I believe that is on Saturday there is going to be another big protest marking 20 years and in fact trying to remember some of those lessons uh, and, and use it to the Ukraine war and try to point out some of the issues you talked about as well. So thank you so much. And that's all we have time for today. Uh, we'll be covering more of these issues, including the marches we talked about in the coming episodes of Daily Debrief. Keep watching People's Dispatch.